sacrifice that our veterans and our families of our veterans made until we spent 12 years in Rapid City, South Dakota. Eight miles outside of Rapid City is an Air Force base called Ellsworth Air Force Base. We had the privilege of having one of their officers in our small group, he and his wife. We had the privilege of sharing in their lives and they in our lives for about eight years, which is very unusual in the military that they could be there that long. There were many times when my friend David was deployed. He was a flyer like many others. There were Christmases when we in our small group would go to their house to put their children's toys together before Christmas because he was deployed. There was one particular day I remember all too well. There had been a training accident with one of the B-1 bombers, and they had lost four pilots and people in the back seat. David was deployed, and so I had the privilege of escorting his wife, Liz, to that funeral. I had never realized how much these folks give for each of us so that we might be free. Today we remember those who have given that ultimate sacrifice. They've given their life so that you and I could worship here today freely without any fear. And as we do so, we need to be mindful and remembering that great gift that they've given to us. And I believe we need to be thankful. And with that as the overarching thought for the day, I want us to kind of segue to a parallel time or place or person that we need to be thankful for and celebrate, and that is the Lord God. I've chosen a particular uh, passage from the book of Psalms, and if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there. If you don't, that's okay. It'll be on the screens. But we're going to dig down into Psalm 145 today because as we do so, I want us to see who God is, what he has done, and the character traits that we need to remember and be thankful for on this Memorial Day weekend. Be mindful that David is writing this psalm. And he says to us through this psalm, if we look carefully, this is who God is. These are the character traits of God. 
So let's take a moment. Get our minds, our hearts ready for what God's word is going to say to each of us this day. Join me in prayer. Father, we have already sung a song that reminds us to wait for whatever you have for us. So as we come together today, we pray that you would speak to our heart and to our mind, to our very core of our soul, in such a way that we can hear that we can hear your voice to us. Even though we don't hear a literal voice, we sense, we know your presence. We know that you have something for us. So whatever it is for us individually, um, help us to block out those things that might distract us. And help us to focus on what you have for us today. Pray in your name. Amen. A couple years ago, <clears throat> I was going to my dentist for my typical six month checkup and uh, cleaning. And uh, I had gotten to know the, the dental hygienist from previous visits, and the six months prior to that, I, could, I, I had met, and she had told me uh, that she had just had a little baby girl. And they were so excited about her little baby. And, but they were also so excited because for the first time in quite some time, she and her husband were going to get away on a vacation, just the two of them with another couple. Although it was kind of hard to leave the baby, they were thrilled to be able to get away. That was six months before this visit. Fast forward to that visit and I said to her, so last time I was here, you had described that you were going to have a little vacation. How did that go? And she said, oh, it was absolutely wonderful. We had the best time. Now, it was hard to be away from our little daughter, but it was wonderful. We had a, the greatest time. It was so relaxing. It was just wonderful. And as I thought of that this week, and realize that many of us have been kind of planted at home for the last 14 months, how many of us are just yearning to get away. We're yearning to have a little R&R. Maybe it's to the beach. That's a place that Kathy and I have talked about looking forward to getting back to sometime in the near future, at least in the, hopefully in a year. Or maybe it's uh, to climb a 14 or some place here in Colorado. Maybe it's to be out on the river rafting or fishing. Uh, maybe it's to go to Lake Powell, as I talked to a friend this week who went last weekend to Lake Powell to boat. I don't know what it is for you, but my guess is for you as well as for me, when that time comes, we're going to be thrilled. It's going to be a great time. And we might even say something like this, oh, I could do this forever. But I want you to see, David, as he writes this particular psalm, he describes something to us in this psalm that he could do forever. We see it in the first three verses of the text. Psalm 145, verses 1 through 3. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord. And most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. David writes these words and he describes how what he could do forever and ever is worship the Lord God and praise his name. He even uses that word extol in the text, which means to have such great enthusiasm. And as we look at these verses and those coming up, I want to draw your attention to three character traits that we can draw from this text. Three character traits of God that are the source for his reason for worship. 
as well as his reason for thankfulness. And hopefully we too can see these character traits of God and be reminded of them, and that will then lead us to worship and well, as well as to be thankful. Friends, today we need to thank God because God is great. In verses 4 through 6 of our text, we read these words, and David writes, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. Now, in verse 3, David says, uh, speaks of God's greatness, and he says it's unfathomable. That's a tough word, isn't it? Unfathomable. Beyond our understanding is what it means. God's greatness, this text says in verse 4, extends from generation to generation. I remember a prayer that I was taught from my parents that I believe that was handed down from generation to generation to generation. It goes like this. God is great and God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hand we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. A prayer that was handed down to my folks, which was then handed down to us, which was then handed down to our children from generation to generation, speaking of the truth of God, that God is great. A truth that was repeated over and over and over again to the point that it was embedded in my mind and my soul. And it stuck that God is great. You know, when we say God is great, sometimes words just don't do a thought like that justice. Have you ever noticed certain experiences life in life, you, you just can't quite find the right verbiage, the right words to describe that experience. It just doesn't do it justice. When our two children were born, and I was present there at that time, the, it was so amazing, so awesome. It was, it was beyond the description of words. God's work, God's deeds... God's power, God's majesty, God's mercy, his character is so very, very, very great that it's almost beyond words to describe. And yet, think about it for a minute. Is it not true that sometimes it's difficult for us to grasp the greatness of God? Is it not true that sometimes because of where life leads us and the seasons of life or the struggles of life, sometimes it's so easy for us to lose that freshness of God's greatness? And in the process of the ups and the downs of life, and I'm sure many of us have experienced it over the pandemic, sometimes we lose our perspective of God's greatness. A couple months ago, uh, a friend of mine who is in, the leader, in a leadership role in the denomination in which we serve before retiring called me, and she said, uh, David, we're, we're starting a course. It's an eight-week course, um, and it's called Emotional Healthy Spirituality. And I'm looking for people who will not just take the course, but then lead a small discussion group as we go through the course. And uh, there are like 70 people all across the country who are on Zoom to do this particular course. And uh, so every Wednesday we get together and there's a little bit of a video and, and then we break down after we've done certain things throughout the week in this course and then I help lead a discussion of other pastors from the denomination. There are like five of them in my group or four of them, I guess there are. Um, part of this particular course is you read a chapter in this book and, and the 
the whole course was developed by a guy by the name of Peter um, Scazzaro. And uh, you read a chapter in his book, and then you do a, a daily devotional twice a day, morning and evening. Now, the interesting thing is, when you start the devotional in the morning and in the evening, it begins with two minutes of silence. Have you ever tried to be silent for two minutes? It sounds so simple. But you know what? Two minutes is a long time for those of us who are used to talking a lot. But the whole purpose of that two minutes is for the person before we read the scripture, before we read the devotional, the whole purpose of that two minutes of silence is to kind of refocus our thinking and let go of all those other things that may be distracting us and to focus our attention on the greatness and the goodness of God. And it is not to talk to God and give him all of our requests like oftentimes our prayers are. I want to encourage you to try it. I have found the best way for me to do is to go to my study, which tends to be a quiet place unless we're taking care of grandkids. Then it's not so quiet. And I know those of you who have children, it's very hard to find a quiet place. You may need to go to your car. Close the doors. Close your eyes. I know there'll be distractions from outside. You'll hear something in another room or you'll hear something outside the window, whatever it is. Try to focus. And for me, I just focus on my breathing and then I say something like, Lord God of mercy, forgive me, for I am but a sinner. And it's amazing how it helps to get perspective. I want to encourage you to try it. And while you're trying that, and after you're trying that, remember that in God's greatness, he provides for your needs individually. You know, one of the, my favorite all-time passages in the New Testament comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It goes like this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. You think you've got it hard? Nothing that you and I experience is unique. He goes on to say, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, not if, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Friends, God doesn't just abandon us when times get difficult. He doesn't say, good luck, you're on your own. No, he is for us, and he is faithful. David shares a similar thought in the 13th verse of this 145th Psalm. He says, the Lord is trustworthy in all of his promises and faithful in all he does. When, not if, but when you feel like things are out of control in your life, remember God is still in control. Remember God is still great. And thank him for his greatness. Thank God for he is great. Second, thank God for he is good. God is good. David continues in verses 7 through 9 of our text. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow in anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Now, I, I feel fairly confident that all of us have times when we can say, God is good. God is good. But I'm also confident there are times when all of us um, sort of feel like God's goodness is kind of drying up a bit. 
We're not feeling God's goodness. We're not sensing it. We're not experiencing it. And it's easy for us to begin to question a little bit. And we need to be reminded of what David writes in this psalm. In verse 7, he says, God's goodness is abundant. Next verse, he says, God is compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding and rich in love. In the very next verse, in verse 9, he says, the Lord is good. James, in the New Testament, wrote this short little book in the very first chapter, the 17th verse. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from our Heavenly Father. It's easy, I think, when times are good for us to say, God is good. It's more difficult when times are challenging, when you're experiencing, when you're facing a difficult situation in life, it's more difficult to say, oh, God is good. Because there seems like a cloud that sort of uh, envelops us And it makes it hard for us to see. But friends, don't let those clouds blind you. Look for the good. It's there. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Today, take a few minutes and make a list of how you have been blessed. How you've been blessed by the people that God has placed in your life how you've been blessed by the natural, God-given talents and abilities that you have, because we all have them. Sometimes we overlook them because we're just so used to them. Make a list of the purpose that God has for you right now. I, I have to tell you, when I retired, my purpose shifted. And I had to kind of rethink and retool as far as what is my purpose now in retirement. And I think that happens at different stages in life. But God has given you a purpose. Write down how God has blessed you with relationships in your life, especially the relationship that hopefully you have with him and he with you. That you are known and loved and called to serve. Friends, on this Memorial Day weekend, we need to remember God's goodness. And we need to choose to be thankful. You see, thankfulness is a choice. We can choose to look at life and see all the things that aren't the way that we'd like them to be, or we can choose to be thankful for what we have how God has provided for us. So on this Memorial Day weekend, I want to encourage you to choose to be thankful for the unseen people. The people that oftentimes get overlooked. For our veterans and their families. For the nurses and the doctors and the first responders that have brought us through this pandemic, for those who were the researchers that brought the vaccinations, and I don't want to get into that whole topic. How about this one? For the teachers and the educators that just finished a year of school that, trust me, as a a spouse of, my, my spouse used to be, my wife used to be a school teacher, a high school teacher. I know how difficult it is, at least from the outsider looking in, as a teacher, they have had a tough year. How about the grocery workers? The one that check you out in the grocery line. Choose to be thankful for those unseen people. Uh, Many of you know that uh, we have four little grandchildren that run around here every Sunday. Um, They were running around just a few minutes ago. They're off at jump school and off in the nursery right now. But they're running around all over the place. The third one's name is Ben. Ben is two. Ben is a charmer. If you know anything at all about Ben, he'll look at you and he'll give you this sweet little smile. It's not uncommon if we take them 
uh, to a restaurant, like sometimes we take them to Culver's, and we'll be sitting at our table, and there'll be a group of young ladies over this. He'll look over at them and give them this big smile, and he's just charming them, charming them, charming them. But one of the things that Ben has learned from his folks or school, I'm not sure where, if I hand Ben a glass of water, he'll look at me and he'll kind of flirt a little and he'll say, thank you. If I help him in his car seat, he'll look at me and smile and say, thank you. He is a thanking machine. And oh, that we could learn something from little Ben. That each and every one of us could be a thanking machine. Thank God today that he is great and he is good. And lastly, thank him that God is gracious. Verse 8 of our text says that God is gracious and compassionate. Verse 14, a little bit beyond our text that I read earlier, or is part of the text, uh, the Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The Lord is gracious to those of us when we have those times when we fall, when we stumble. And then verse 18 and 19, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord hears our cries and he's gracious. He saves us. Some of you may know that over the last four years, I've coached high school softball. It's one of those regional teams where we take girls from Glenwood, girls from Roaring Fork, and then we uh, meet at Basalt. That's where it's focused. But we take players from all three schools. And um, it's been one of my retirement gigs. It's been part of my purpose to still have input into young people's lives. This past fall, we were blessed to be able to play even though we were in the midst of the pandemic. It was very, very difficult, it was challenging, but I said to the girls, every game we get to play is a gift. Every game. I can remember one particular game. We're up at Basalt, and let me just say, after four years of coaching, you get to know the other coaches that you coach against, which, by the way, I had a great experience with them. You also get to know all the umpires because it's the same people umpiring your game. They're all kind of doing the Western Slope thing. So you get to know them. We had this particular game, and uh, the ump behind the plate, uh, let me back up and say, we were on offense. I was coaching third base, and um, our girls were at bat. And the ump behind the plate, I know. He's a great guy. But his strike zone that day was like, where was it? Uh, it's just like, you got to be kidding me. And uh, I mean, it was just like ridiculous. And so one of my players was at bat, and he called the strike. I'm not exaggerating. He called the strike at her eyeballs. And it struck her out. And she just looked at like, what? And I looked at him, and I said, ump. Up here, come on! Just sort of like that. And he, he, you know, here's something you need to know. You can talk to an ump, but it doesn't work to question their strike zone. It's not a good thing. But I was, if you hadn't noticed, I'm kind of competitive. And um, I was in the thrill of the game. I was caught up in the moment. And I just said, you got to be kidding me. It was way up here. And he took off his mask, and he looked at me, and he said, that's enough, coach. And it was like, okay. What I want you to see is, I messed up. I shouldn't have questioned that. And quite honestly, the next game, when he came back, the first thing I do, I went to him and apologized. But what I want you to see is, when I messed up, he was gracious. He was gracious. The fact is, we all mess up. It's part of our DNA. Just part of who we are. Nobody is perfect. 
Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 3. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a pretty inclusive statement. All. And I want you to know that God has every right to hold those mess-ups against us. But I also want to remind you that God stepped in and graciously provided Jesus to redeem us from our mess-ups. God forgives us when we acknowledge the times when we mess up. And he clears the slate with his outrageous grace. And because of that, you and I need to show others grace. Just as that umpire showed grace to me, I need to show grace to other people, and you need to show grace to other people. Who is it that you need to show some grace to? Maybe it's a neighbor that you've kind of been on the outs with for whatever reason, and you need to show them some grace. Maybe it's a coworker that you've kind of been at odds, and you need to show them some grace. Maybe it's a family member. I know that gets a little close to home, but maybe it's a family member that you've kind of had some difficulties, you've kind of had some rough patches, and you need to show them some grace. Uh, maybe it's a team member. You're on some sort of team or some sort of club community group, and you need to show them some grace. I'm reminded of something that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, catch this, think about such things. Don't get caught up on the things that separate us from other people. God has shown you and me grace. We need to show others grace too. Philip Yancey wrote a book a number of years ago called What's So Amazing About Grace? Listen to this one sentence that he wrote. The world thirsts for grace in ways it doesn't even recognize. The world, people all around us, thirst for grace. Especially in this world there's, where there's so much contention about this group and that group and this idea and that idea. The world thirsts for grace. So remember on this Memorial Day weekend, show some grace. Because God is gracious, and God is good, and God is great. Thank God. Join me in prayer. Oh, Lord, we confess there are those times when we get caught up in life so much so that we forget who you are and we forget what you've done and we forget how you are alive and at work in our world. Forgive us and help us to remember, to remember who you are and what you've done for each of us. And help us, Lord, to choose to be thankful. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.